Good day and welcome to CITK Online. My name is Henry Nell and I serve as the youth pastor here at Church of the King. Today, I want to invite you to get connected. If it's your first, second, tenth or hundredth time that you are watching CITK Online, I want to invite you to get connected in the spiritual family. You can do that by filling out the connect card on our website or using the link down in the description box below. Today, I would also like to say thank you so much for your generosity. I want to thank you for sowing your money into God's kingdom and trusting Him and see what He can do globally and locally. Today, you can give by texting the number available on the screen. You can also use our website or our app. Thank you and enjoy today's word. Well, hey, good morning and welcome to COTK Online. It is great to have you guys this morning. I am Josh. If you do not know me, I'm one of the pastors here at Church the King and I'm honored to be with you here this morning online. Uh, Just a quick note, if you are in Lake Charles, we'd love to see you in person too. Um, So we have two services at our Oak Park campus and also one in Kinder as well. And so we would love to see you not just here on the screen, but also face to face. And I hope you guys are having a great Sunday morning. As we jump into this message, I'm gonna be talking today um, the message is called "We Neglected the Ark," and uh, it's it's about it's about that very thing. So you get to kind of figure out what that is. But let me ask you this question: Just think about it for a second. But have you ever neglected something? Uh, you think for me, food in the fridge, especially you know, a college student. I think back to some of the stuff I left in the fridge and would eat on it. I remember uh, some friends coming in one day, like, "Oh, you got some food?" I'm like, "Yeah, there's some food in there." Like, "Oh, cool. What's this? Some chicken spaghetti." And so they start dishing up, like, "Hey, how long has this been in here?" And I was like. I don't know, maybe a month. <laughs> it was probably, anyway, we tossed it out. But it's not a very good thing to neglect stuff. Your checking account, man, if you don't neglect your checking, if you neglect your checking account, you don't pay attention to it, bad things. You forget to feed the dog. Um, I have a kid who will remain nameless, um, but often neglects to, um, to brush their teeth. And uh, so it's never a good thing when you're around them, uh, when they have neglected that. But we're going to talk about the nation of Israel today and how that applies to us. But Israel had a neglect problem. And so when you look back, we're looking, um, we're going to look in First Chronicles 13. Um, but what had just happened is the nation of Israel has gathered to make David king. And so there's been a several year kind of battle in a sense between the people that supported David and the people that supported Saul's son. Um, That has just ended. And so they've all come together to make David king. And uh, this is David, the one who has a man after God's own heart. And so they get together and they decide after David's been king, the first thing they want to do is they want to bring the ark of God out of hiding. And so look at 1 Corinthians uh, 13, verse 1. David consulted with all of his officials, including the generals, the captains of his army. When he addressed the entire assembly of Israel as follows, he said, Hey, if you approve and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send messages to all the Israelites throughout the land, including the priests and the Levites in their towns and the pasture lands, and let us invite them to come and join us. For it is time to bring back the ark of God. Now listen to this, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. That's important. The whole assembly agreed to this for the people could see it was the right thing to do. And so David summoned all of Israel from the sure book of Egypt to the south, all the way to Labo Hamath in the north to join together in bringing the ark of God from Kiriath Jerim. I'm going to highlight that in just a second. But for right now, it's at this town that's near the border of the Philistines. So all of Israel went there uh, and they brought back the ark of God, which bears the name of the Lord who is enthroned between the cherubim. They placed the ark of God on the new cart as they brought it from Abinadab's house. This is where it's been. It's been in the guy's name. His name's Abinadab. It's been in his house, okay? Uzzah and Ohio, these are Abinadab's sons. They were guiding the cart. David and all of Israel was celebrating before the Lord with all their might, singing songs, tambourines, playing musical instruments, lyres, harps, cymbals, trumpets. This was a party. The Ark of God has not been anywhere near. It's been in a dude's house for a long time. And so they're bringing it back and it is a huge party. The whole nation's celebrating. When they arrived at the threshing floor of Nacon, the ox stumbled, and Uzzah reached out his hand to steady the ark. Then the Lord's anger was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him dead because he had laid his hands, excuse me, he laid his hands on the ark. And so Uzzah died there in the presence of the Lord. What in the world? Okay, like there's a whole lot to unpack here. So I'm going to kind of go through it because we're reading this thing and you're like, wait, wait, what? Like, okay, so first it's been in hiding and then like now they're coming out. It's with like these ox are pulling it. It trips, it stumbles. The dude like reaches out and God like just like obliterates him. What in the what? Okay, so there's a lot. First of all, what is the ark? Okay, the ark was built. This is during the time of Moses when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. It was built to house the stone tablets where the Ten Commandments were. Okay, but more than just housing that, 
it was also the place that represented the presence of God. And so this, anywhere it went was a sign of God being with the Israelites. And we see this, by the way, in what we just read, because it says Uzzah died there in the presence of the Lord. And so the ark was this picture of God being with the Israelites. It was a sign of his presence. Um, it also was a place, and I'll hit on this later, but where they would come and they would uh, put the the blood of the atonement. Every, every year there was a sacrifice that was given, um, the sacrifice and atonement that paid the price for the sins of the nation. So the priest would come and he would put the blood on what they called the mercy seat was a spot um, on the top of this um, ark. And so that's what it was, okay? Why was it neglected? Now, this goes back 50, 60 years. This is not a short time, okay? So before this, like, like a long time, in 1 Samuel, so if you wanna go back and do some cool reading, go back and read 1 Samuel. We have the story of Eli the priest and his sons. He was the chief priest. Um, they would minister in Shiloh where the tabernacle was, okay? And so they're responsible for representing, the priests were responsible for representing the priests or the people before the Lord. And so they'd take the offerings, the sacrifices, and they'd bring them to the Lord. Um, they would do sa um, sin offerings. They would do um, grain offerings, all sorts of different types of things. But that was their job was to represent the people to the Lord, kind of like a modern day pastor, but like a modern day pastor on steroids, all right? And so here's the problem though. Eli's sons were not good dudes, Okay, these were not good dudes. They were actively engaging in sin with the people that would come. They were taking bribes. They would go and they, uh, if someone would bring the offering, they would come and get the peace they wanted before they were supposed to. And they would take what they wanted, not what God prescribed to them because God said, hey, you can have things certain ways. There were women that served at the temple. Eli's sons were having affairs with them. Like this was all going on. And these were the guys that were supposed to be representing the people to the Lord and the Lord to the people. And so God warns Eli many times. He's like, hey, you have to deal with your sons. In fact, actually by law, they should have all been put to death. Eli's two sons should have been put to death. And God, for whatever reason in his grace, allows them to continue to be alive. And he warns Eli, Eli does nothing. So finally God says, hey, guess what? Because you're honoring your children more than you're honoring me, I'm gonna like your whole family. I'm wiping out your whole family. And that actually does come true finally during the reign of Solomon. Um, but like Eli's whole family ultimately disappears because he does not put God first. So the, the boys and Eli, they're already neglecting it. But what happens in this time frame is Israel's going to war with the Philistines. Now, Israel's been oppressed by the Philistines back and forth. They've been going back and forth. And so they're at this big battle and someone says, hey, you know what we should do? Let's go get the ark. Let's go bring God with us into battle because if God's with us, we can do this. And so they go out and they get the ark and they walk into the, the Israel camp with the ark. The whole place is going berserk. Everything's like, yeah, this is amazing. The Philistines hear this. They send a spy over to figure out what's going on. They're like, dude, the ark is in the God. The, their God is with them. Like, And so the Philistines actually say, hey, you guys got to fight like men. Like if we don't fight today, we're toast. And so they go out, defeat the Israelites in battle, crush them and actually take the Ark of the Covenant with them back to their cities. Now, what happens is they put it before their God, they put the, the Ark of the Covenant before their God and their God falls face down in front of the Ark of the Covenant by the next morning. They set the God back up, he falls down again, hands break off, everything like he falls to pieces, literally in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And so like, okay, whoa, this is trippy. So they send it to another town. While they're there, these guys start getting tumors. They start getting a plague of rats. Like, and God punishes these guys because he's going, hey, guess what? You weren't supposed to take the Ark. I know my people were stupid, but you're not supposed to take the ark. And so they do this whole thing where they take these two cows who have calves that they just were born, tie them to a cart, put the put the um, the ark of the covenant on the cart, and say, "Okay, look, we're going to send these cows back." So the cows literally go back into the nation of Israel, yelling for their calves. They put the calves back in a pen because they knew that if it was a God thing, the cows would go away from the calves. But if it was a, not a God thing, they would go right back to their calves. And so sure enough, the cows go right into Israel. The ark is taken, placed in this guy's house. And it's been there for years. It was there for 20 years before Samuel starts to really lead this revival, um, the prophet Samuel. And then from there, it's almost 40 years of Saul's reign. And it's been this guy's house. So his family's grown up, they've been around it. And so it's just been sitting there. No one's brought it back. Another quick question to answer. Why did the Lord just fry Uzzah? Okay, like you read this thing, you're like, dude, Lord, what's the deal? He was just like, he was just like try, trying to help out. What's the big deal? Here's the thing. I'll, I'll give you like a quick little answer and then we're gonna get in this a little bit. But Uzzah messed up big time. And like, it wasn't just him, but he messed up big time. So I'll hit that later, put a pin in that for later. So before we go on, before we do anything else, let's ask one more question. 
What in the world does a box that can kill you in the Old Testament, if you touch it, have anything to do for me today? Great question. Okay, we're not like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark here with Indiana Jones and going in there and seeing the lid come off and everybody. That's a great movie. Um, but why does this matter? Okay, we're talking about the Ark. Why does this matter? As I said before, the Ark represents the presence of God. Okay, when Uzzah died, it says he died in the presence of the Lord. When the Israelites came, like they all freaked out. The Ark represented the presence of the Lord. It also, the Ark was where, again, as I said, they placed the offering for the uh, the day of atonement for the like and this covered the sin of the entire nation okay so for us when we think about the ark what it means for us today the ark and we know that jesus went and he paid that he actually in hebrews talks about how he brought his blood and he actually offered it in heaven and said hey i'm covering for the sins from all mankind all time but when we look at what the presence of god is now it is it is or the ark of god for us that is the presence and that is our relationship with god that is our ark and so when we're thinking about, when we read through the Old Testament, we think about the ark. We need to think about it in terms sometimes as well of our relationship with God and the presence of God in our life, okay? So David's looking at everything, all right? He's just stepped back into king and he goes, hey, we've got this problem with the ark. We've got this problem with our relationship and the presence of God. It's not here. It's sitting in some dude's house. So three big things about the ark of God. It's true for the nation of Israel and it's especially true when we think about the presence of God in our life. Number one, you cannot neglect the ark. Okay, it's been this dude's home for a long time. It's a lot of neglect. That means for the whole time, no priest for 60 years, probably no priest has been standing before that thing every year as he was supposed to do and go in and offer the sacrifice for their sin. No one's been coming before God on their behalf and saying, hey, like, God, I'm, I'm here. Like, let's, 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 make, let's make peace between us. And no one's been doing this. 60 years it's been sitting there, okay? No priest. This was amazing to me. This has been, by the way, this has been going on for 400 years at this point since the Israelites left Egypt. For 400 years, they've had someone every year who would go in and offer the sacrifice on atonement on top of the Ark of the Covenant. It's been there. This has been going on for 400 years. And all of a sudden, one battle, it goes over there, it comes back into some new house, and it just sits there. You can't neglect the ark. No priest, this is what's amazing to me, no priest stepped up in that time frame. Now, we know Eli died and a couple of his sons, but there were other priests. It wasn't just Eli's family. Nobody steps up in that time frame to go, hey, you know what? We're gonna bring the ark back to Shiloh and we're gonna, it doesn't happen. Saul, he's appointed king and he was one that God actually said, hey, this is gonna be a good leader of my people. He's head and shoulders, he, he looks good, he can lead. Saul, the whole time, never brings back the ark. In fact, Saul, one of my favorite things to, to compare in scripture is the difference between King Saul and King David. Saul would ultimately, when he would repeatedly refer to the Lord when he was talking to Samuel, the prophet, he would say, hey, the Lord, your God. Whereas David would say, the Lord, my God. So Saul neglected the ark. He, he it wasn't even his God. He was, that's the Lord, your God. I'm serving something else. That's the Lord, your God, Samuel. So Saul neglected the ark. The priests neglect Saul neglects, the nation neglects. And so when David gets there, he recognizes the Lord is with him. And David goes, hey, you know what? We can't do this anymore. But here's the thing. When you neglect your relationship with the Lord, when you neglect the ark of God, everyone else around you suffers. So since this time has happened in Israel, there's been, they've been repeatedly under the thumb of the Philistines. Constantly, the Philistines have set up garrisons now throughout their land. And so when they neglected the ark, the enemy moved in. And when you neglect the ark of God in your life, the enemy begins to set up camp in your life. He begins to put an outpost. He begins to take pieces of your heart and of your life and of your soul and of your kids and of your situations around you. Why? Because you don't have the presence of God there anymore. And so he's coming in, he's taking what he wants and he's controlling what he wants because we've neglected the ark. We cannot neglect the ark. And when, when you do that, you're gonna suffer, but also the people around you are gonna suffer as well. All right? Quick question on this while we're talking about it. Why do we neglect the ark? Number one, I think we neglect the ark because God's not a priority for us. That's a big thing. We don't make God a, pro a priority. By the way, huge shout out to all of our guys who just went through Fight Club. We did Fight Club here at Church of the King for our men. It's been a, a men's Bible study, but so much more than that. We had over 80 guys that regularly attended and 42 guys like completed the whole challenge. That's crazy. These guys made God a priority. And what's significant about that, by the way, is when in a family, when the husband gets his life right with the Lord, 93% of the family, like 93% of the time, the rest of the family will follow. When the husband gets his life right with the Lord, 93% of the time, the rest of the family gets their life right with the Lord. If a wife gets her life right first, 17% of the time the family comes. If a kid 
3.5. And so it is so important, guys, I'm gonna talk to you for a second. Like it is so important for you to put, make God a priority because when you do your whole family, you start, you start kicking the enemy out of your family's life. Those outposts that he set up, they start to go. Why? Because you're prioritizing the ark. I think we neglect the ark because we're busy sometimes. We got so much stuff going on. We, we Again, God's not a priority, but busyness becomes part of that. Fear. Sometimes we neglect God's ark, his presence in our life because we're afraid of what he might ask us to do, the things he might ask us to, to, to give up. We're afraid to trust. Sometimes we don't. We neglect the ark because we like our mess. Sometimes you neglect the ark of God in your life because you like your sin. You'd prefer to hang on to your anger, your attitude, your money, your control. These are all things that God asks us for. And so we neglect sometimes the presence of God in our life because we like our mess. We like the things we're involved in and, and we would choose to prefer to keep hanging on to those things rather than embrace the better that God has for us. And sometimes it's just out of ignorance. But you are, I'll tell you this, you are responsible for the ark of God in your life. If you are married, in like the ark in your family's life, like if you're, if you're a husband or wife, like you're responsible for the ark in your family's life. And if one of you isn't, isn't a believer in your family, by the way, if you're a spouse, if you're a husband or wife and you're married to someone who's not a believer, it's so important that you care for that because guess what? God's gonna use you to reach your family. All right, so we can't, we can't neglect the ark. You also can't misuse the ark. Oh, Uzzah, like you, like, the dude reaches out. Okay, so why is that such a big deal? Here's the thing. Pastor Todd's going to actually talk about this more next week. Um, he and I were talking about the messages and, and he was like, what are you preaching about? I was like, I'm preaching out of 1 Chronicles 13. And he's like, dude, I'm doing 1 Chronicles 15. So you're, it's, it's going to be kind of a continuation and you're going to enjoy it. But there was a very specific way to interact with the ark. It had to be done by priests and the Levites. It had to be carried on poles and it could definitely never, ever, ever be touched. Okay, this, by the way, was such a big deal when we get into like they would actually tie a rope around the priest's ankle with like bells. And so when he would go in every year to offer the, the, the sacrifice of atonement, if he wasn't right, like if he had sin in his life, if he had things, if he interacted with the presence of God wrongly, the dude was dead. Like, and I think, by the way, I think we forget that I think we've, we've lost the fear of God. And so much of what we do, we treat God so flippantly. We forget this is the God who literally breathed the universe into existence. And we have lost a lot of holiness. But, but Uzzah, here's the thing. By the way, and I'll, I'll read you this. Pastor Todd's going to read this next week. But in First Chronicles 13, this is David talking. He goes, hey, because you Levites did not carry the ark the first time, the anger of the Lord burst out against us. We failed to ask God how to move it properly. There was a way that they were supposed to interact with the ark and they misused that. And by the way, when you misuse the ark, it impacts everyone around you. And how much, like, I know as a pastor, I've heard a lot of stories about people who have been hurt because someone misused the presence of God or the ark. How about, like, if you've ever been, um, been had the Bible weaponized on you? Like, I've seen this, uh, you know, you, man, growing up, it's not a thing now, but growing up, you talk, there was in Ephesians 5 where it says, wives submit to your husbands. And you hear that, wives, you got to submit to your husbands. I had one guy I knew in particular as a teenager. His son was a friend of mine and just watched how this man used that verse to just abuse his wife, totally forgetting the, the verse right after that says, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. But people will misuse the ark. They'll take, and they'll take something and they'll, they'll take a Bible verse out of context and they'll use that to, to rubber stamp something they're doing. Or how about this? If you've grown up in a, char in a charismatic Pentecostal church, um, there, there has been doctrine where if you didn't speak in tongues, they didn't consider you saved. That's not scriptural, but that was something that was where people were misusing the presence of God going, hey, if you're not speaking in tongues, you're not actually saved. And so there's this whole thing where, where when you misuse it and you can hurt people, that's what happened with us. Uzzah was a, was a byproduct of someone else misusing. He reached out and touched it, obviously, but man, he should have never been in that position, okay? And so we put people sometimes in bad positions because we've misused the presence of God. And, and here's the thing, like this is the God of the universe we are interacting with. And the, the Uzzah's challenge is this, he grew up around the ark. Like he grew up with it in his house. And so there can be for us sometimes the long we grow in our relationship with God or the longer we're around church or different things, we can become very casual with something that that we need to treat with holiness, with honor, with respect. It's kind of like, you know, it's like getting really comfortable with a nuclear warhead. 
<laughs> like where you just, let me just, hey, let's use this nuclear warhead as a football. It's a really bad idea, okay? But we end up doing that sometimes in our walk with God because we have forgotten who he really is and how powerful he is and how holy he is. And I'm sure, I'm sure he probably, when he was a kid, Uzzah probably threw a ball in the house and it bounced off the ark. He may have bumped into it once or twice, but like he didn't have that respect. And so, man, when we think about misusing the ark, man, we've got to be so careful. Eli's sons, they misused the ark for their own sinful pleasures. We already talked about that, but, but they, would, they would use the ark and what people came there for to get their own fix. Um, we like the whole God is love thing, man, God, because God loves me, he's okay with this or he's okay with that. And we use God's love as an excuse. We misuse God's love as an excuse or as a cover for us just doing whatever we want. Israel misused the ark by bringing it to a battle that God didn't tell him to. Okay. And we do that, by the way, we do that all the time when we go after what we want and we just ask God to kind of bless our mess. Like we go, okay, God, I'm going to do this. Be with me, Lord. And we don't stop and go, okay, Lord, is this you? We do that a lot. That's how we misuse the ark in our life. And at the end of the day, the, the antidote to this is to walk in obedience to the Lord, to his word. Like the way we don't misuse the presence of God in our life is by making sure that we are lining up our life with God's word. That's why it's so important. You are in God's word. Third thing is this. You can't despise someone else's ark. Okay, you can't despise God's, someone else's walk with God. When you start getting the presence of God back in your life, when you get it for the first time, when you're growing your walk with God, I'm gonna tell you this, not everyone is gonna be excited about it and definitely not as excited as you are. And we see this with David's wife, Michael. Here's the thing, Michael was actually the daughter of Saul. And so she's watched all this and she's actually stood by David through a lot. But in this moment, in 1 Corinthians, uh, or 1 Chronicles 15, 29, it says, as the Ark of the Lord's Covenant entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window. She saw the King David skipping about laughing for joy and she was filled with contempt for him. She despised what was going on. And I don't know why we're not filled in with some of those things, but she was not pumped about this moment. She actually later on, she's like, she criticized him for, for looking like a fool out there. And, um, and so here's the thing, a couple things in this one. one. Number one, for you yourself, regardless of anybody else, regardless of what they say, what they do, you still have to pursue the ark of God, the presence of God in your life. You have to pursue the Lord. Here's the other side of that. Guess what? Church is not gonna look just like you think it should, okay? And, and, and regardless of where you're going to church, regardless of any of these things, your walk with God is what you're responsible for. You may, like, as a pastor, our pastor, Pastor Todd, he's responsible for, for the, the environment of our church. But each of us are resp responsible for the environment of the church that's in our own life. Okay, when you look through church history, and we, we get, like, so wrapped up around the axle. I grew up in the Assemblies of God Church, and I remember growing up and going, man, if these guys would just get the relationship with God like we do, man, we'd be doing awesome stuff. And then the longer I grew, I realized that, Man, God was using all sorts of different types of churches, from the Catholic churches to the Baptist churches, to all these different stuff. God was using them. And guess what? Their walk with God and how they did church looked really, really different for me. But I think the thing that rocked me the most, that, that shook some of this, because here's the thing, like I'll, I'll, I'll pick on us charismatics first, but sometimes what we call the spirit moving in services in our life can be a lot of our emotions. It can be our church history. It can be our pride. Like if you've come from like a more charismatic background, like I did, sometimes you can look at people and go, man, you guys aren't spirit led enough. Or you can look at even how our church operates and go, man, I don't like how this works. But you know what? That can be pride. It can really be pride. And I remember having a conversation with, uh, with Lindsay. Um, I call her my sister. She and I were, are very, very close and still remain very, very close. Um, we grew up together and we were both at this point. Now we were in our twenties with even thirties. And we're just talking about life growing up. And she'd gone on to ministry school, ultimately married a guy and they live in Alaska now. But um, she'd said, hey, you know, when we were in high school, like I was really struggling with the way I was partying. And I was like, you were partying? She's like, yeah, I was partying. She's like, this person was partying, this person was partying, this person was partying. And I realized pretty much my entire YouTube, except for me and my brothers, like we're partying. Like they were doing whatever they wanted. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm, I'm confused for a moment because these are the same kids that I've watched what I thought was God doing great stuff. Maybe he was, but watched as they would go to the altar. They'd weep, they'd cry. They'd, they'd fall in the presence of the Lord if you come from that. Like all these different experiential things. And I've watched them do this at camps and at church and all these different things only to realize it didn't 
actually make it all the way into their life at the time. So I was looking at these other kids that I knew that weren't having those same experiences and looking at these guys and go, man, if you'd have their experiences, you'd be rocking. And then I moved to Houston and I meet these two Catholic kids who were on fire for Jesus, loved the Catholic church, like so on fire for Jesus. And so we get so wrapped up sometimes with how someone's arc looks and how like, I think the ark should look like this. I think the presence of God should look at like this. I think it should be like this. And so, let me tell you something. It's pride. It's pride. We look at Michael. She was pride. You can have, the other side is you can, you can come from a background where it's more of a, a church culture of reverence. And, and we can call what we call reverence and honoring that can really just be our comfort zone. We're afraid to step out. We're, we're, and that's pride. We can look at all these different things, regardless of our background. We can look at how a church is doing service, how people are worshiping, and we begin to operate. We despise someone else's ark. This is pride. And like, we can't despise that just because it's our tradition. And by the way, traditions aren't bad. They are great. I love some of the traditions we have from family traditions to church traditions. But you know what? God's been moving throughout history. And when we look at things like the charismatic renewal that we have now, it started back in 1900 in Houston. Like the, the, the speaking in tongues was not something that we saw happening worldwide until around 1900. It, it had disappeared in practice. And so God revived that, I really believe. But we look at all these, God was still moving in the 1800s. He was still moving in 1000 AD. God was still at work just because some of these things are not, weren't, up in operation, weren't in operation. God was still working. So when we come to church services, we come around there people, we got to know that just because it looks different, the way they're worshiping, the way the presence of God, just because it, it's different doesn't mean that God's not at work. I just want to challenge you on that because man, look, we are called to walk in unity. And guess what? Maybe the things that you're wanting to see in church are the things that you need to do at home. Like maybe those are the things that you need to, to make sure that you are incorporating those things in your life. Maybe you invite people in your home and have, have church and your home every once in a while. That's great too. But we just guard against pride. First Samuel 16, 7. I'm almost wrapping up. I know we're probably going late here. First Samuel 16, 7 was Samuel going and selecting the next king because Saul, is his heart's a mess. And he's looking at this first guy that he's looking. He's like, man, this is a great dude. This is the king. And the Lord says to Samuel, he goes this, he goes, don't do judge by his appearance or his height for I've rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the way, see things the way that you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so I just wanna challenge you church to guard against the desire to despise, to criticize the way that someone else is worshiping the Lord, the ark in their life. Okay, so as we wrap up today, how do we not neglect the ark of God in our life? And I've got four things. And if you've been listening, I've really kind of hit all of them a little bit as we've been going through. But the first is this, you have to continually turn your attention to the Lord in your life. And this is something, there's a, by the way, if you want a great book, it's a small book, it's a simple book, it's an amazing book. It is called The Practice of the Presence of God. And it's written by a little monk named Brother Lawrence. And he was a shoe repairman and a cook in a monastery. But his relationship with God was amazing. And his practice was this, he would just throughout the day, whenever he was doing something, whenever he would catch his thoughts somewhere else, he would take those and he'd turn them back to the Lord. And he would just begin to have conversational prayer with the Lord. Hey Lord, I'm over here cooking today. You know, God, like help me to see you. And he would just begin to bring God in throughout his day. So we do that, man, simple places, um, taking time to pray at, at, at meals. I know a lot of us don't, and it, it's, a, it's an old tradition, but man, it's a great way to remind ourselves that what we have comes from the Lord. Bedtime. I mean, every night before, like we have a tradition in, in my home, and we've done it since they were kids. We take time and we go and I, I tuck my kids in, pray for them, kiss them. And it's a simple prayer. It's nothing big and crazy, y'all, but it is just a simple thing. Um, with your spouse in bed, the practice that Kelly and I had for, for well, our, our marriage was in night before, at night before we'd fall asleep, we'd grab each other's hands and we would just pray. And sometimes it's a really simple prayer. Sometimes it's a lot more involved. Most of the time I'm halfway falling asleep and she's like, hey, babe, wake up. But these are simple things, little things throughout the day. Take your time to, to quiet yourself and listen, but look at ways you can continually turn your attention to the Lord in your life. Because here's the thing, if you will do that, you're gonna start seeing God in operation in some really cool ways. I'm seeing more and more little things and picking up and going, oh, that's the Lord. Ooh, that's the Lord right there. So we gotta continually turn our attention to the Lord. You gotta spend time in his word. Get a journal, write down what you're seeing. You gotta read, the, like, read it, ask questions, talk to people, get online, research. Here's the thing, you gotta apply it. Eli's sons knew the word, they just didn't apply it. 
okay? And they were a mess because of that. They knew what it was. They knew what it said. Eli knew what it said. None of them applied it. You've got to spend time in God's word and you've got to apply it to yourself. By the way, one of the things that Pastor Todd and I go through, and this is actually coming out of our readings right now, where we're at is the McShane reading plan. We start it every January 1. We start this plan. It takes you through the entire Bible in a year. I encourage you to do something like that, if not that. But you need to be in the word. You need to read God's word. It's amazing. You got to surround yourself with godly people. You got to be around people. They're going to do life differently than you. They're going to see things differently than you, but you need to surround yourself with people that love the Lord and love you because that's what we need. Paul said, hey, don't forsake yourselves gathering together as some do because it's like, it's the encouragement. That's what we do. We need to get together. And the last thing is this, knowing all of this, we've got to choose obedience to God's ways. The reason why all this started off in the very beginning, the reason why they neglected the ark, the reason why Uzzah died, the reason all these different things is because it started with them not putting God first and obeying God and what he said. And so I'm going to challenge you to get into God's word, to find out what he has to say and apply it to your life. I'm going to pray for you. God, I just thank you so much. Lord, that you love us so much that God, even looking at Eli and his sons, how many opportunities and new chances you gave them to make things right. God, you're so patient with us. And Lord, I pray that we would not neglect the ark, your presence in our life. God, that we would seek you, Lord, that we would just, in the simple things, Lord, throughout the day, that we would turn our heart and our attention to you. Um, God, that you would put the right people around us and that your word would come alive and that we would walk in obedience to you and your word. And I thank you for that, Lord. I pray just for every single person that's here today, that's, that's watching, that's listening, that God, that you would help them to prioritize you in their life. And that, God, they would not neglect the ark of your presence, but they would walk with you fully. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you guys have a great week, and we will see you back next week for Pastor Todd bringing his part to this. So I'm looking forward to it. See you guys then. 